So the thing about this video is that there's only about a 30% chance, I would say, that either of these two topics will come up in your GRE or GMAT tests. And they tend to only come up at the higher end anyway. But we're not gamblers, we are students and we want to learn more. And just in case it does come up, we want to learn this. And also we just wanna learn for our own life. So I'm gonna to introduce to you two new topics to the channel and that is the handshaking question type and circular tables. They're not big enough for each of them to have their own video, so I thought I'd do them both in this video. What am I talking about? Well, let's take this question. 10 people are standing in a dark room silently. Everyone in the room agrees to handshake every other person in the room. How many handshakes will there be? A very common misconception is to do 10 people in the room times 10 handshakes equals 100. Or, more commonly, 10 people in a room and each person in that room is actually going to shake nine other hands because they're not going to shake their own hand and therefore it'd be 10 people times the nine other people in the room, 90 handshakes. But first of all, I'm going to tell you that both of those are wrong. And second of all, I'm going to give you a choice. There is a particular formula we can use for specifically this type of scenario, when each engagement is between two people or two objects. There is a formula, for example, handshakes. A handshake involves two people, so we can use a formula. Or football matches, where there's a, a league and each team is gonna play the other team. Or a match involves two teams, so we can use the formula. But I'm also going to give you a way that uses the combinatorics formula that I've covered in other videos. I'm not gonna explain that formula here. That formula is here only for those students who already know it from my other videos. As I've said down below, you've got formula one, formula two, or just speeding through it. What I mean by speeding through it is that you can logically deduce the answer if you think hard enough. Each person in that room, each of the 10 people, is gonna shake nine other people's hands. So it does make sense to say each one of those 10 people times the nine other people that they're gonna shake hands with. The thing you would have to think about if you're doing this logically, however, is that person A shaking person's B hand would be counted for A and would also be counted later on when you were doing B's handshakes. So you'd be double counting every single handshake. It would count for the first person, one of the 10, and it would count for the second person, one of the nine they're shaking hands with. So you'd end up with a double count. So logically, you'd have to halve that total to get the real answer. That's what you would do if you're doing it through logic. Or we could use one of these two formulas. So again, this formula, n times n minus one over two, is for those of you who really love formulas and want to add another formula to their list. And this applies, just to say it again, only to situations when each engagement involves two people, football matches, handshakes, etc. Those are the common examples that the GRE or GMAT will use. You simply do n times n minus one, in this case, 10 times 10 minus one, which is nine, divide by two. And that will tell you how many handshakes there will be in total. Some of you will react to that formula going, yes, Philip has given me another crucial bit of information. Great, that's a great formula. Other people will react, oh no, like why is there a new formula? Why can't I just use my existing methods? And for those people, I'd say, yes, we can use our existing methods. If you know combinations, if you don't know combinations, watch my other videos. If you do know the combinations formula, you'll know the combinations formula looks like this. N factorial over N minus R factorial, R factorial. And I spoke about very heavily in that video, that applies when you're choosing a group out of a larger group. But that's what a handshake is. There are 10 people in total in the room and a handshake involves choosing two people in the room to engage in a handshake. So you can actually think of this kind of question as a combinations formula and not have that new formula on the left at all if you don't like it. You can say, well, the total is 10. That's the total number of people in the room. And we need to find out how many combinations of two people there are because we're choosing two people to have a handshake. And the formula on the right will tell you how many different combinations of two people 
you can have from a group of 10. And yes, you can check it. They both will give you the same answer in this question and every question that involves two people. What's better about Formula 2, even though it looks a bit more complicated, is that it can be extrapolated to much larger situations. Engagements where there are three people per group, for example. Whereas Formula 1 is only for handshakes, matches, anything involving two people. So take your pick, pick one method and stick to that method. All of these answers, by the way, if you plug N as 10 into the formulas, and R, by the way, for Formula 2 is 2, because we're choosing two people for a handshake. If you plug the numbers in, you'll all get 45 as the answer, no matter which method we use. Now that you've decided on your preferred method, I'm going to give you another question, a harder question, the hardest kind of way they can ask this type of question and see how you go with it using your preferred method. Right. In this situation, we have each of six chess players in group one. Hint, hint, a chess match involves two players, so either formula applies. Each of six chess players in group one will play the rest of their group once, while each of five chess players in group two will play the rest of their group twice. There will be only one overall winner from each group, and those two winners will play each other once in the final. How many chess matches will there be in total? Obviously, this is quite a hard example, so don't blame yourself if you get it wrong, but I do encourage you to pause the video and try if you can. So group one is a bit simpler. It's a bit like the handshake question. You've got six people and they're each gonna handshake each other or play chess against each other. And a chess match involves two players and therefore we can simply apply either formula. Six choose two for formula number two or six times five divided by two for formula number one. And either way, we would get the same answer. There is formula one, there's formula two, and either one is gonna give us the answer of 15 for group one. Group two sounds harder because they're gonna play the rest of the group twice, but don't be intimidated by that. Just pretend that they're gonna play the rest of the group once. You would still use the same formula, right? If you're choosing formula one, five times four divided by two, if you're using formula two, five, choose two, and you get the same answer for both of them, 10. But then that's gonna happen twice, right? It's like if in question one I'd said, you're gonna handshake each other twice, you get the answer, 45 times it by two, because you're gonna handshake twice. It doesn't change the situation just because we're doing the thing once, twice, three times, whatever. It's the same formula, either formula one or formula two, it gives you the same result. It's still, having engagements involving two people. In this case, chess, in the last question, handshakes. And so the same formulas apply. Using either formula, you get the answer 10 for playing chess once, but they're gonna play the rest of their group twice. So we double that, so that's 20. And then did you notice it says the overall winner from each group is then gonna play each other once in the final. So we have to plus one to that answer in order to get the actual answer because we can't forget that final game of chess. 15 plus 20 plus one equals 36 matches of chess. A lot of words, but the underlying concept is simple, whichever of the two formulas you use. And now for something different, which is circular tables. So what you've probably been wondering in the title and thinking, how does that relate? It doesn't really relate. I mean, the formula kind of looks similar and it's a new formula, but it's not strictly to do with handshakes because this definitely doesn't involve two people. I'll show you the type of question that they could ask. Again, not particularly likely to come up in your individual test, but there's a chance, right? For this particular type of question, maybe a 10% chance. But if it does come up, you don't want to be sat there being completely confused. You want to be able to know how to answer the question. The previous formulas, by the way, for handshakes, are more likely to come up. That comes up more often. So if there's one of these two that you want to super prioritize knowing, it's the previous two question types. This is just a fun one to end on. Could come up, but less likely to come up. And that topic is circular tables. This is the kind of wording they might use. An event organizer is deciding to sit six guests around a circular table. Two sitting arrangements are considered different 
only when the positions of the people are different relative to each other. What is the total number of possible sitting arrangements for the group? Now, some of you will put your hands up and go, but Philip, I thought that when you had, say, six people in a row, then the number of arrangements is six factorial. That's kind of simple, right? You could have six people in the first seat, and once that person sat down, then you've got five options for the next seat, four options, three options, two options, one option, etc. Six factorial, and that will give the total. Why is it any different if there's a circular table? Why isn't the answer just six factorial? The difference between a row, a straight line, and a circle is that in a circle, each position actually has n duplicates. What do I mean by that? Well, imagine a row of people, six people standing in a row, and say you've got A, B, C, D, E, F standing in that order from left to right. That's the only order. There's no duplicate of that position. That's just the one position where they're standing in that order. It's not like there's another example where you've got A through F in alphabetical order that you can produce. That's the only way to do it. But in a circle, imagine you have A, B, C, D, E, F in a circle, sitting in a circle. And then if everyone stands up and then moves one spot to the left and sits down again, you still have A, B, C, D, E, F in that order. And as the question says, that's not considered a different position because they're only considered different positions when the relative position is different. And relatively speaking, you still have A sitting next to B, who's sitting next to C, who's sitting next to D, etc., all the way around. So it's the same position. Yes, they may be in different physical seats and in different positions in the room, but relative to another, the table is still A, B, C, D, E, F in a circle. And if everyone stood up and then moved one to the left again, it would still be A, B, C, D, E, F. All of that is a long explanation for why you have to divide by n because of n duplicates. It's not just n factorial, it's n factorial divided by n because in circles, there are always n duplicate positions that you have to eliminate. Now, as before, there's two ways of remembering that with formula one and formula two. And you might say, why is there two formulas? Well, the second one is just based on the explanation I just gave you. It's n factorial, that's the total, divided by n, because of the n duplicate positions. Formula one is the exact same thing, it's just one step further in the working out, right? n factorial is n times n minus one times n minus two. And you, if you notice with n factorial in formula two at the top, it starts off with n times n minus one, etc. But then there's an n in the denominator. So what formula one does, it just cancels out the n and then you're just left with n minus one times n minus two, which is just n minus one factorial. So it's the same formula just written in a different way. And you may see it written in different ways on the internet, but I am reassuring you it's just the same formula. So pick one of those two ways and memorize it. And that's the formula for sitting in a circular table or in a circular arrangement. Again, we're dividing by n, because of the n duplicate arrangements that exist in a circle, essentially because of like the rotational symmetry that you've got going on. And that doesn't apply to a straight line. I don't want to worry you, this doesn't come up too often, but actually, if you do choose to spend the time to memorize and appreciate these formulas, there's just that chance one of these two question types or both of these two question types could come up in the real test and you'll be laughing in the exam and pointing at everyone else in the exam going, yes, I watched Philip's video, you didn't, you suck. But anyway, you could do that, or you could just stay silent. Either way, these are the two methods for working out handshake, or chess or football situations involving two people and circular tables. Rare topics, but now you know how to do them. Pick your method, stick to it. See you in the next video.